Welcome everyone back to the Pathways to Success podcast. Today in studio, I have Emmanuel Kumfa, Chief Warrant Officer Emmanuel Kumfa. Emmanuel, welcome to the podcast. Thank man. you. Happy How to be here. Yeah, I was really uh, very fortunate to have run into you into the gym <laughs> because I didn't know you moved so close to where I yeah, live now. I should have been there since 2015, I believe. You've been there since 2015? Yes, we moved there from downtown. Uh, we decided to buy a house. I think Wiley was the best. It was kind of a compromise between the distance from Dong's walk and then the schools. Yeah. So they had better schools in Dallas and everything else. So, gotcha. Yeah. So did you just start working out at that gym? or? Yeah. Because well, I've never seen you there. Yeah. Yeah, I just started walking out of there because I have my own set at home. But then mm -hmm. with Evelyn being... Your new baby girl. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. yeah, so it's kind of hard for us for me to walk out at home while she's sleeping. So, And that's the only time I get to walk out if she's sleeping. So I decided to just go ahead and get a gym membership. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Well, yeah, I was I was excited to run in, into you because you know, obviously your your wife and my sister have yeah. been very good friends for, for a, a long very, time. Long time, <laughs> very long time, and we've yeah. kind of operated in similar circles. Yeah. And I've always known you were like a real life action hero, um. but I didn't actually know what you did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So um, because of who you are and what you've done, I think there's a lot of lessons that we can learn from your experience, and that's why I wanted to have you on the podcast. So, so if you would, Emmanuel, tell us a little bit about what exactly is it that you do. Okay. Well, I'm a chief warrant officer in the seabaring field. I don't know if most people know about WMDs, Weapons of Mass Destruction. Mm -hmm. That's kind of my niche in the military. And what we do is we pretty much train the military as far as Army, Reserves, Firefighters, when we do local responders and the Marines, I don't think, I don't have any dealings with the Navy or the Air Force, but we train them how to respond to incidents that has to deal with weapons of mass destruction. So it could be something that uh, could be hazardous, just like chemicals, like a chemical plant, and you have a hurricane and something happens and it creates a major disaster, we train them how to respond to that. Or a terrorist incident happens, somebody uses a biological uh, weapon or chemical weapon, we train them how to respond to those incidents. And how did you get into this? Uh, joining the military. Joining the military, okay, all right. <laughs> yeah, so it, it's kind of a funny thing. When I joined the military, they had, I wasn't a citizen then. You weren't a citizen, so, Yeah, okay. so I had a limited pool of jobs that I wanted to do, and I know I wanted to stay in the science field. And it was either becoming a, a nurse or doing a seaburn, what we call seaburns, chemical, biology, biological, radiological, and nuclear yeah. specialist. Well, I wanted to do the seaburn because, and I'm sure a lot of people are going to, I agree with me on this. Your recruiter tells you you're going to have a lab coat. You're going to be walking in your own office. You're going to have your own uh, laptop. You're going to have your own Humvee and everything else. That didn't happen to be the case, but that's what drew me into this line of uh, job. But as I grew into it, initially, I didn't really like it, but getting higher in the ranks and I saw what it entails and how much importance there is, especially after uh, September 11. Yeah. Kind of like what I do now, so it's, it gave me gave me a different perspective of what I had when I started as a private to where I am now as a warrant officer. Got it. Yeah. Okay. And, and what branch? Of, which branch of the military are you? Army. In? You're in the army. Yeah. Okay. Got it. So, like, kind of like walk me through sort of like your schedule and kind of like what your life is like. What's the day in the life of someone who <laughs> does what you do? Okay. So. Um, Luckily, I do the same thing in the civilian side as well as in the military. So I think I'm going to break those two out because it's a little bit sure. different. Okay. On the military <laughs> side, I get up. Obviously, I want to have this. Shave it off, yeah. put on my uniform. Then I go on to my duties. Right now, I'm currently the XO, the executive officer for a chemical unit out of uh, Fort Worth, Texas. So I go in there, and we have about 150 soldiers. And my role is just a managerial of a scene role. I have a dual hat. Mm -hmm. I either I brief my commando on all probably the seaburn threats or trainings that we have going on, and I advise them on how to tackle those obstacles. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I oversee some of the soldiers' regular days, tasks, and duties, and stuff like that. On the civilian side, I actually build the POIs, so the point of uh, training, points of instruction. So when I sit home, I develop training plans, I build labs, and I come up with different scenarios that when I go out, and put my civilian hat on and actually train the soldiers. I throw these different scenarios at them and then have them execute and actually complete this task. So you kind of like train the trainers. Train the trainers pretty much, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. And what is it now, you said their specialties responding to, del to weapons of mass destruction, right? Yeah. So what are kind of like some of those activities that you specifically train them to do? Like what will they get as a result of your training? Well, so 
there's different facets of weapons mass destruction res uh, response. So you have your reconnaissance aspect as well as your mass casualty contamination aspect. That's a, it's a little bit broader than that, but I'm just going to break it down in those two. Reconnaissance aspect, we train them on the different sciences of different hazards. So they understand what are the signatures of different chemicals, how to identify them, and how to respond and how to mitigate them. Yeah. Um, on the mass cal area, we train them on how to, uh, if they go into a mass casualty response incident and they have a lot of casualties, train them how to decontaminate those casualties and take them to the proper authorities for medical treatment and stuff like that. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, there's another tier of it that mostly we don't do with most of our teams, but we do specifically with the civil service support teams, which we have one in every state. Some states have two. We train them on uh, pretty much in-depth analysis of the different type of hazards radiological, chemical, or biological, or nuclear. Mm -hmm. And then we set up scenarios as well, just to pretty much they have what we call the NEMSO, which is like a science officer. Yeah. That has to go in there and try to figure out what the hazard is. So we create POIs for that NEMSO to actually go in and sit down. It could be a tabletop exercise, or actually at a full blown exercise, we'd have to go in into the hazard zone, find the hazard, and come back and run it through a lab and determine what it is. Gotcha. Yeah. And you do this for U.S. installations all around the world, is that right? Yes. So the way it works, which is kind of funny, um, we train all the installations in the United States, mm -hmm. and then we train some of the installations around the world. So wherever the, uh, the State Department has contracts with, with the allied nations, right. we go out there, we train them on the new equipments, and we actually train them on, on the tasks and procedures and how to respond to these incidents. Gotcha. Yeah. Wow, so you have trained all around, like how many countries have you been to? Uh, right now, outside the United States, I've been to five and counting. Five and counting, gotcha. Yeah. So I'm curious, what are some of the, you know, the, the pathways to success is all about, you know, understanding how people have achieved success and the lessons that you've learned. Yeah. So I'm curious, like, what are some of the lessons about leadership, about, it sounds like you do a lot of training. Yes. What are you learning from all this? Um, you know, when you look at movies, yeah. especially I'm sure a lot of people agree with me, there's that notion that there's a direct leadership in the military where I tell you what you do and you do it. Yeah. It's not the case. Really? So there's, there's five different tiers, which is the same thing in the civilian world, where mm -hmm. we'll, the type of leaderships that we actually instill in the military. You have your direct leadership, obviously, what you see in the military. And it has its place, because in basic training, me as a private going in, I need to gain structure. So you need that person that tells you what, what to do, when to sleep, when to get up, pretty much to structure your whole day for you. Right. And that's just for you. You get into that system. It adapts you as you're going into that system. Then you have um, your transformational leadership. That is something that happens, especially in my level. I don't direct people anymore. I'm supposed to inspire them. So when I'm training them, I don't train them. I don't direct them. I just train them. I give them the ins and outs of their decisions, and I give them a reason why they have to do what they're doing. So it's kind of like... Um, motivating them to do the right thing, okay? Yeah. In a sense, and then there's another plot of literature you call, uh, I don't know, right term for this, participational leadership, yeah. for lack of a better term, where you sit down with the individuals. It's like, uh, I guess, the king of the round table, like uh, King Arthur, where yeah. everybody has an input. Sure. However, you still look, as a commander, you have that decision at the end of the day, but you still talk to everybody, get your insight. And I find that that works a lot better, especially in the reserves, because there's a lot of soldiers that have backgrounds in science. They have, P they have masters and stuff like that, that if I go in with my bachelor's or my little degree and try to instill something that they know they have a higher understanding of more than me, then I'm selling myself short. Yeah. So I have to have that idea or that experience in the table to give me their insight and I put it and formulate it into my decision making process uh -huh. and then come up with a, a final decision to go with it. And then there's, uh, there's one that I don't really have, I don't have a, the right definition for it, but it's more of a transactional mm -hmm. leadership where I give you the pros and cons of you disobeying my orders. So it's more of, okay, you either do this or this is going to happen, or if you do this, okay, you get promoted. If you don't do it, this is what is going to be in action. Yeah. And then the last one is delegational, where I come in as a leader. I tell, like, this is what my commander would do. Come in, I'm the executive officer, tell me, hey, I need this done. He doesn't tell me how he wants it to get done. Yeah. He just tells me it needs to get done. Then I'll go down to my platoon leaders and say, hey, this was to get done. I delegate down to them, and they delegate it down. So I found out that 
to be a successful leader, you have to know when to apply those hats. You cannot just be a directional leader all the time. Because right. if you're a directional leader, then you're going to sell yourself short because you have, say, 150 soldiers. If you have to direct everything, you know, leaving yourself time to actually do some other things that you need to do, that's your deliverables at the end of the day. And at the same time, if you're an inspirational leader, then you're negating the fact that some of the soldiers that you have in your unit might not really, you might not be reaching to them. Yeah. So you have to be able to be able to reach out to everybody. You have to know which soldier is going to adapt to which type of leadership and be able to put that hat on when it's needed. So. How do you gain that awareness? Um, it's, it's something that the military instills in you because we have tiers of leadership classes that we go to. So me coming in as a private, I was mostly used to directional leadership because obviously I'm trying to gain structure. When I gain a uh, squad leader or kind of a somewhat of a manager, if you want to call it, mm -hmm. then you get a delegational leadership where they tell you, hey, this is what I want you to do. And you've gained the trust of your leaders and now you have to execute. So as you're going up, higher and higher you learn those and then as you look back down and you see the, the big spectrum of everything then you start understanding how why the military taught you that way and how to apply it as you're going in future new units and stuff. Mm -hmm. so everybody that has grown up from a private or even the officers that just come in as a first lieutenant all the way to a general they experience that during their training as they're going it's incumbent on them to actually apply that yeah because it helps them out because there's a lot of stuff going on that you cannot just wear one hat all the time how many, how long have you been in this role for? Uh, as an executive officer? Yeah. Uh, two years now. In a training capacity overall, how long? About six years. How many people would you say you have trained by this point? Oh, God. Uh, Hundreds? Thousands. Thousands, okay. Yes. Yeah. So what would, you, what would you consider to be the key into instilling knowledge in someone and then actually getting them to do it? Because, you know, you and I are doing <laughs> two very different kinds of training, right? Yeah. Mine is more sales training, yours is a matter of life, much more yeah. important. Yeah. But like, how does that translate, right, for a trainer who really has a desire to help someone, to give them information, but how do you inspire someone to take action? It's, it's I, like I said, we have two different leaderships. You are mostly for, your training is mostly for sales, and right. mine is for life safety. So I think right. mine is kind of easier. You probably have it harder, and I think you do a, a lot better job than I'll do in your, si in your section. Yeah. Mine. It's kind of in a gray area where it's a life and death situation. So with me going to train them, I just tell them this is the ins and out. Yeah. And the inspiration comes into the fact that you can actually give you your life experiences, things that have happened before. Um, I don't know if you've watched the Contagion movie, Contagion or the Dirty Wars. No. Okay, those are kind of key examples of stuff that you're using for motivational, uh, motivational training when you have go into your class before you do your training. You probably turn on a movie, put on a clip on car, Dirty Wars is a British movie that has to do with a, a nuclear, actually radiation exposure yeah. by terrorists in uh, somewhere in Britain. And you just have them watch it and see the chaos that came out of it because nobody knew what they were doing. Yeah. And then you probably have that initial shoe in the motivation. So, okay, this is what we don't want to happen. And it, you also got to realize that everybody that is in this line of business have a vested interest. Yeah. When we train them, especially in the homeland uh, in the United States, I make it incumbent on them to realize that what they are doing is not like they're going out there to go fight a war. Obviously, we're soldiers initially. Yeah. We, we have to take our weapons to go fight and defend the United States, we will. But my line of duty is to prepare them in case it's a disaster in the United States or an attack. So family-wise, if you don't pay attention to this, it could be your family. Yeah. All right, so it could be your mom, your daughter, or anybody, your friends, or anything you know. And when you bring that home to them and you bring September, September 11 home or all the different ones that have been averted and we're still averting, thank God, they kind of get that motivation because they're the first line of defense. Interesting, yeah. yeah so they, 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 there's a vested interest at that point that, okay, maybe I need to pay attention because I could be the difference tomorrow between saving somebody's life and actually creating more harm. So that's why I say, in a sense, my job seems like it's easier because yeah. there's that vested interest already there to learn it because everybody in this field has that vested interest. That's why they're in. Mm -hmm. So me going in, I have like an easier scenario or set of mind or set up ready for me. And it's just easy for me to instill that in them. And it's easy for them to grasp what I'm trying to instill to the, in them and then execute it. I think the key component I got from there, though, that is translatable is that you almost gave their work a higher level of meaning, meaning by tying it 
to something that impacts more exactly. people. Exactly. Like, like framing it kind yes. of, right? Yes, yeah. In the frame of reference that they would understand better. Not just, okay, this is what you're coming at your 95 and doing, okay, this is your impact. Yeah. Outside of this environment, this is what you could be, this is what you could do for the United States or for your immediate community, for that matter. What have you learned about how human beings learn as a result of this? I think they, they have a sense of ownership mm -hmm. initially because when you give them, show them the importance init initially when I go out, and I don't understand I'm in the military, but mm -hmm. when I go out as a civilian to train them, I always make it important to let them know that what they're doing is important and I appreciate uh, their services, although I'm wearing the same hat as them, yeah. to give them a sense of importance and then we'll go into why they have to do it, give them the different motivational speech and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But I think once you put everything on the table and you give them that insight, everything becomes easy. Yeah. They themselves become the motive, they by themselves come up with different scenarios and come up with different things to challenge you as a professor to actually push them further than what they need to be. Yeah. Yeah. So like I said, it's always been easy because of the nature of what we're dealing with now in the society. Yeah. And it's just easy to me to go in there and then have a gainfully employed classroom ready to learn and eager to ask questions and move, get a higher understanding of what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what would you consider to be like the most important lesson in leadership that you've experienced from, from, from training leaders and, and doing the kind of work that you've done? Um, I've learned that you are not always the smartest person in the room. Yeah. It's always better to have an insight of everybody, have everybody participate. I think participational leadership, and what I do, participational leadership, and um, there's another one, there's two of them that I use mostly, participational and inspirational. Those two come in handy for me because I've found out that, especially in my uh, unit, we have all this tier of people. Mm -hmm. We have regular responders that does, do hazardous response and that's their day job. You have firefighters that work in the unit and they have different tactics and procedures using the firefighter department that could benefit my unit. So whenever I go into a situation and I sit down, I try to come up with a scenario, come up with a standard operation procedure, I have those key people with those experience sitting down on the table with me and I ask them those questions like, hey, why do you think this is? I mean, I have the science background and I have my own train of thought, but I could be missing something. So have them, having them participate in that environment also helps me out come up with a better plan and everybody feels like when everybody actually participates in that developing that plan they feel like they have a sense of ownership in that plan and they're more willing to yeah to execute and then one other thing also again that is just in this aspect of things when it comes to WMD response and then when it comes to regular military um, operations then all the other four or three comes into play you have to know when to place it and you got to understand not every soldier is going to respond the same way. You cannot be rigid to every soldier the same way. And nine times out of ten, it's going to be a, it's going to be a hindrance in your leadership. So you, be, you have to learn who you're working with. So I guess on the civilian side, and, and I'm not very well versed in this, there's this, if you have a big corporation like Walmart, mm -hmm. right, the, I'll call them foot soldiers or just regular workers, mm -hmm. probably wouldn't have that much experience with your manager, the senior manager and everything else. And that cuts away, there's that sense of, I don't want to call it dehumanization, but that personality is not there. You don't develop a sense of personality on understanding the ins and outs of everybody. Yeah. Where I am in the military, I understand that for me to be able to affect, to be an effective leader, I have to know everything about that soldier. I have to know family life, what makes them tick, what are your issues? So when they comes into work, I can look at a soldier and tell them if they're having a, see if they have a bad day or a good day, and I can sit them down and talk to them. Because my leadership doesn't only end when they come into work and leave. It transcends that. I should be able to call them during the week and see how they're doing and make sure they're doing well. Because what we're doing is, what we're doing with them or what their job is, in case something happened in the United States, it could be a life and death situation and I, it's invested upon me as a, as a leader or manager of soldiers, if you want to call it that, to make sure that they're well taken care of. When they're coming to work, we're addressing all of their needs within our capacities and if we can't, make sure that they have a chain to go to, mm -hmm. to address those needs. So when they come in and something happens in the United States or if we have to go outside the United States to go to a war, I know for a fact that I have private soul here, he's ready to go, everything at home is good, or even if it's not good, he knows I'm tracking and I'm with him. 
Yeah. So there's that sense of camaraderie that's built up. So that's why I said initially when I started, most people think the military is more of a direct leadership. It's more than that because in our current society, you have to understand the soldier. You have yeah. to understand what makes them tick. You have to understand your social life and everything that there is about them to be an effective leader. So you can discern when something's not going right and you can try to fix it. That is really interesting because I have to say, Emmanuel, I'll be honest with you, I was in that boat like you see in the movies and you're like, yes, sir, you know, whatever. Yeah. That, that kind of thing, right? Yeah. Where it's like, I think you mentioned direct leadership. But yeah. um, it sounds like you have much more of an empathetic approach where you're yes. actually trying. Yes, I know most people don't <laughs> think it, but it's <laughs> yeah. actually true. Right, exactly. And you, you would see it. I mean, don't get me wrong. When you go, like every soldier, when they go to basic training and everything else, they do the direct stuff. Mm -hmm. And they get away from it and most people tell you they don't want to do it anymore and when they come into the unit they're expecting that yeah and they're taken aback when the commander or the platoon leader sits them down and say okay how many kids do you have and then they start just conversation on it so like oh yeah. i thought you it's like no there are five different chairs of leadership that we have to instill and you just got to understand and again don't get me wrong some soldiers need the right leadership sure <laughs> and you have to instill that with them but you have to be able to play the gambit on all five and understand how what is going to make the soldier tick and then use that on them. Is it ever appropriate for you to be vulnerable in front of the people that you're teaching, like showing that you're a human too, that kind of thing? Oh, like uh, definitely. Um, I work out a lot. Yeah. Okay. So most, most people don't realize this. When I, I realize that you look like an action figure. <laughs> yeah. no, I don't I mean, even like sitting next yeah. to you. Yeah. No, the thing is, <laughs> most people don't realize I've failed my f physical fitness test twice Get in the military. Town. I have. And uh, that's one thing that I always tell people because when I joined the military, I usually didn't like walking out initially. And when I started walking out, I was mostly lifting weights. Yeah. So the cardio was not there. So I could do max my push-ups, max my sit-ups, but then I'll fail my run in the military standard. It doesn't matter if you might pass the push-up sit-up, you fail the run, you fail. Oh my gosh. So that is usually an eye-opener when we have soldiers that don't like walking out and I sit down like, hey, dude, I was in your, I was in your boot, like your shoe yeah. a few days ago or a few years ago. And guess what? When I started, I was the same, same scenario as you. I failed this, but guess what? I do better now. So you, you, when you give them that sense of, hey, I am not the guy that rests, dress and I can max everything, but yeah. before that, I couldn't, and I had to walk to get to it, then it makes them say, okay, you know what? I can get there as well. Same thing applies with uh, the WMD stuff. When we're teaching them, we go into things that we've gotten wrong because thank God we've not had any major incidents after September 11 in the United States. Yeah. So we've finding out through trial and errors that some of the scenarios that were built initially doesn't work, so we have to adjust accordingly. So you bring that stuff up to them. And sometimes when you do that, you see the soldiers actually open up, like the, the soldiers with PhD in uh, science who tell, okay, well, I think you probably messed up on that. Yeah. And it's incumbent on me on the leader to say, you know what, you're right. I didn't think about this aspect of it. Thank you for to, uh, telling, uh, pointing that out to me. And then I adjust your plans to meet that aspect. Mm -hmm. Because science, you can never trump science. And if a soldier has a better understanding of science than you, then you should probably listen to them, especially in the environment that I'm working with. So the sense of vulnerability is definitely needed. You have to be able to show the soldiers that are vulnerable when it's needed for them to see it. Yeah. And you have to show them a strong point, especially if in a war scenario, and you have to do direction relief, you have to show them that leadership. And they will be able to, if they know you well, they'll be able to discern that and trust you more mm -hmm. when they're faced with any situation with you. Interesting. So you yeah. mentioned an interesting word, right? Trust. Yeah. What have you learned about the nature of trust? It sounds like you, you started with a little bit from like giving of yourself, but yeah. what have you learned about earning people's trust? Um, in what respect? In the respect of gaining cooperation. Gaining cooperation. Yeah. Um, I think that's the ultimate gold in every transaction. I know working with soldiers and everything else, you can get cooperation for so from the soldiers here, Joe or Murphy, whoever the name is. Mm -hmm. But if you don't get that trust when you're going to war or you're going to a situation that you might you need them in a hazardous response, that could become an issue that could create more hazards for you. Yeah. So trust to me is very important. So respect is earned, trust as well is earned and is gained. I think initially you gain the respect and then you have to walk towards trust. My initial goal, when I meet a soldier from the get-go, I don't care that he respects me. It's the military is already said in such a way that they will have to respect my rank. Right. I look past that. I want to sit down with them and make sure that they trust me, they trust that I have their vested interests at hand. 
if I have to make a decision and I know that it's going to be uh, a hazardous or something that could be a life safety decision, I have to make them understand that. I can get, I would, I will be willing to put on my personal protective suit with them and go down range and operate with them. Yeah. They have to be able to trust that if something happens, I'll take care of them. I'll do, drop what I need to do as a manager, yeah. put on my suit if I have to and go down range and take care of it, take care of them. So if I can get them to understand that and trust me from the get go, then I've won the battle. Yeah. Then everything I tell them at that point, they'll be willing to execute and be motivated to execute at all times. So trust for me is the number one thing. The respect for the rank is already instilled in the military. You're going to get it. Yeah. But that trust is something that you have to build from the get-go with your soldiers. Emmanuel, I'm curious. The kind of line of work that you do is, uh, is very high risk, obviously. It's, it's life and death situations. What have you learned about how to effectively deal with fear? Oh, you're always going to have fear. Um, fear is something, it's an emotion that you're always going to have in your life. Yeah. You just got to learn how to control it. And... Uh, to me, it's, I can't speak for all the other soldiers. I've learned from the get-go that anything I fear, I push myself towards that. You push yourself towards the thing that you're yes. afraid of. Yes, and I just, I, as time progresses and everything else, that fear is gone, and that's the way you're gonna conquer fear. If I fear something and I don't push myself towards it, then that fear stays. Yeah. So I always put myself in situations, so okay, what if this is gonna be an issue for me, then I'll try to get expose myself to that situation. Or say, go into a, I guess, we have a training facility that has a nerve, live nerve gas chambers in them. Okay. Live nerve gas chambers? Yeah, everybody in the seabird wall has to go through it. It's not lethal, but it does... Yeah, not little, but yeah. it shows the exposure. Sure, yeah. What you, you might get exposed to, and this is, what's gonna, this is what the symptoms going to be. So we all have to do it as a sense of, okay, we're afraid of this. And again, like I said, thank God we don't have to deal with it in the United States. But going through training, we have to be exposed in that environment. Mm -hmm. So the same token, we take that out. We bring it out in the civilian world, we want to do all this training, or we get faced with any of the scenarios, and it could be scary as what it is, we have to push yourself towards the fear and execute it. Like I said, fear is one thing that is always going to be there. And courage is not something that's in of itself. Courage is just moving towards fear. Mm -hmm. That's what my definition of courage is. It means to be able to understand that you're afraid, but willing to move towards that fear. Yeah. So... I guess that's, I don't know what, how else to explain it. It's just going to be being willing to move towards that fear is what is make us what we are today and it's given us a better understanding of the type of environment that we're operating in. I love it. Yeah. I love it. You're talking about environments, and I know there's a topic here that we want to discuss. But before we move on to that, like applying this to, let's say, the corporate world, yeah. like if there's one more like piece of advice that you could give for the regular corporate person, sales manager, entrepreneur out there about leadership, like what's the one thing, what's the unique insight that you've gained in the military, in your experience that could be beneficial for them? Um, do not be afraid to, uh, to ask for more challenges in your, in your, in your respective businesses. Um, always be that person that, you know, raise a hand up, I'll take care of this. Yeah. Okay. Even if you don't understand it, what I found out is there is a lot of, there's a, there's a plot of knowledge out there, just especially in the case of the military and you can transfer the civilian world. Every time there's a duty that comes up and nobody understands and I put my hand up for it and probably I have no clue how to do it, but there's a platter of information and a platter of experience just around me that I can tackle and I can bring out, I get, I can tap into and get that information I need to actually resolve that problem. So if you want to move up in life, you have to be that person that puts yourself in the forefront at all times. I think that would be the one thing I would say to everybody. I love it. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Thank I you. appreciate that. So you were talking about environments, and one of the things that you wanted to discuss were the importance of uh, how biases can come from social constructs. Yeah. Why is this an important idea? And again, this again, I'm sorry, I'm going to tie a lot of stuff to the military. Sure, sure. Um, in the military, there's a notion called Army Green. Army Green. Army Green. Okay. All it means is, if I put on my military com my combat uniform, you put in your combat uniform, I don't look at you as a Filipino. You don't look at me as black. Mm. When we go back to the trust thing and everything else, if I have the trust, if we all trust each other, and you trust me as your leader, and I trust you as a subordinate, the whole sex, uh, gender, uh, sexual orientation, your gender, or religious background, 
doesn't apply. And I don't know, I could be wrong if it's just in the military that this applies in because when I go to war, when I go into an environment with my soldiers, I look across the spectrum, all I see is military uniforms. And when they look at me, they don't look at me as a black person or white, we'll come in, come in as a white guy or anything. They all understand that that is somebody I can trust. I can get in the fox, foxhole with that person. And if push comes to shove, they have my best interests at hand. Yeah. So the whole color, gender, orientation, or religious practices is out of the window. But when you transcend, and I could be wrong in this, but with the, the past few years you transcend in the civilian world, it seems like a lot of people pay more attention to that instead. Whereas the key point is to pay attention to the person's inner capabilities and what they are doing. I love it. Okay, so military tells me it doesn't matter if this person is female or male, and don't get me wrong, we have issues in the military. Sure. Uh, we're going through the sexual harassment stuff and everything else, but we'll constantly, we're open about it, and we're constantly working towards resolution on some of those issues. Mm -hmm. But when I go into a situation and I have my platter of soldiers, I can correctly attest that I'm willing to stand behind every one of them, regardless of gender, race, or sexual orientation, or religious background, because I know them I know I can trust them, they know they can trust me, they know I have their best interests ahead, and they know, and I know they have my best interests as well. Mm -hmm. So when I come back in the civilian life and I see that we are more worried about, I'm a black person, you're a white person, mm -hmm. you are a Muslim, I'm a Christian, or um, I'm agnostic or atheist, it doesn't make sense to me because it seems like we're missing the key point what is the capabilities of that person? How is it impacting society? If it's good, then what does it matter if it's Muslim or a Christian or he doesn't believe in God? Yeah. If he's doing something positive for the society, then you should leave it as such. You should see him for what he stands for. Don't, don't judge him based on things that he can't control as far as his race, religion, or, some, or, or social background. Mm -hmm. Judge him for what he's doing for society. And I think that's one thing in my experience that the military has gotten right. That the military has gotten has right. Has gotten right. It's because eliminating the. It's eliminating that bias. Is because in my unit, when I see it, and obviously there's going to be little biases here and there, but yeah. for the most part, when you sit down, you look at the spectrum when it comes to promotions, it's taken out of the hands of the c company. So me and my commander, we can put anybody in for promotion, but that is not our decision. Now, if they don't meet certain criteria, then we can blind them from promotion. But if they are due for promotion, there's a board that is higher than us that make that decision. So yeah. it doesn't matter what their background is, they get that promotion and move on. So yeah. I think what the civilian world can learn from this is just that, that aspect of the social biases that we're instilling in ourselves that is really a mute point because we're failing to understand the inner capacity of the person. We're not judging them based on their capacity or their output of what they're doing. We're basing them on some stuff that they, we're, we're judging them on things that they can't control. And I think that's an issue. Fascinating. What would you consider to be like the most harmful social bias that you see right now? Uh, I think, without trying to get into politics. Sure, uh, sure, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Judging people based on the religious background and uh, all sexual orientation. The reason why I say that is because I have been to different religious countries and I, I like theology. I like to learn different religions. I like to understand why people believe what they believe. Sure. And I've come to understand, uh, realize that every religion has their own ins and outs. They have their own pros and cons. Mm -hmm. Again, it goes back to the person, judge the person for who they are. And I, I don't know why in our society today there's just that belief of you're part of this religion, obviously you're wrong, or you're part of this religion. If you go back to the crusade, you did all this bad stuff, sure, yeah. all these things. But it's funny because we all look at, if you look at it, the, the, the monolithic religion, Christian, uh, Jewism, uh, Jew, Jew, Judaism. Judaism, sorry, and Islam. And Islam. Mm -hmm. We think they fall in the same Bible. If you look at the Old Testament. A Abrahamic. Abrahamic, yeah, yeah, Abrahamic. And then we kind of disperse when you have a different, uh, prophets that came in, or the Son of God, Jesus Christ, and everybody else. Mm -hmm. But then, but the core front of everything, it seems like we originated from one point. But then we've verged our way so far out from each other that it still doesn't make sense to me. And then in the Christian faith in itself, you have Catholic, Protestant, Baptist, Pentecostal, and all the other ones. Mm -hmm. So the dogma, and I think the dogma is man made and still, mm -hmm. is what is causing us to create those differences. But if you pull everything back, you look at it, 
it seems like we are all from the same pool. Mm -hmm. An analogy my dad usually like to use is, if you go into an ocean, like Pacific Ocean for that matter, if I stand at the banks of the sea or the ocean and I take a glass of water, a sample of it, my sample of water is indicative of where I'm standing at a point. So if I'm in the middle of the ocean, I take a sample, it's going to be indicative of that, what is in that middle section of the ocean. If I am in the U.S. section, the Pacific side, and I take a sample, it's going to be indicative of what is on there. Mm -hmm. And then if I'm further down wherever on the continent, I take a sample, it's indicative of that. But the problem is that ocean is one body of water. So all those differences is based on my interpretation. But technically, it's the same pool of water. Mm -hmm. So we have to be able to understand that. And that's one thing that I think society is missing. We have to start judging people on based on the, how they are output in society, not on something they can't control. Mm -hmm. yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. All right. So how do you make sense of all that? I'm curious. Uh, <laughs> it's one of those things where there's this uh, saying that say, um, if you want change, you stay at home. Yeah. So like the, I guess the Navy uh, general said, or Navy uh, field admiral said, if you want to change that by making your bed, if you want to be successful, start by making your bed. So you start doing the little things and then you make sure you emulate what you're trying to instill in everybody. So if I go out and I see something happening with social injustice, I'll be the guy that step in and say my two cents, but not in the sense that's derogatory. I'm not gonna be mean to the person that's doing it. Mm -hmm. Showing compassion to the person that's a victim, I think it's a, better way of doing it than to go on and tell the person, hey, you're wrong. Because yeah. I don't know why they're that way. They might have an experience in them that caused them to be that way to the other person, but yeah. just stepping in and going to the person, the victim, and show them some compassion, hopefully that's going to make that change. And always be that, I guess, harboring of change in the forefront yeah. at all times. That's the way I make sense of it. The way I look at it is, if I am one of those people that goes out and always tell you, you got to do this. Mm -hmm. and always point the wrong in everybody else. I'm not going to solve any problem. However, if I look at a situation and somebody's being wrong, can I go in and show compassion person that's being wrong while the other person that did the wrong is watching mm -hmm. without being negative to them? That brings a different sense of perspective in your mind. It's like, wait a sure. minute. And I'll be nice to them as well. It's like, hey, I understand where you're coming from, but hey, you need to look at this guy. What, did he do anything wrong to you? Stuff like that, just kind of ease the situation out. I think that brings more change. And again, like I said, it starts at home. Yeah. Yeah. You kind of touched on it already. So I'm curious, like, and especially for Allah, there's so <laughs> many questions I got for you. Yeah. But as far as like, how do you deal with conflict? How do you healthily deal with conflict? Surely um, you have dealt with this before. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Again, conflict is an interesting thing. It all depends on the type of conflict. Some situations you have to deal with it head first. Some yeah. you have to be able to, you have to be assessed and say, so, okay, a, a confrontation is not going to be essential. Yeah. Um, I'm one that um, I'll seldomly start a fight, <laughs> put it that way. You will suddenly? I will seldomly. Seldomly start, start, start a fight. fight. Got it. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> I'll be that guy that if you want to punch me, I'll probably just get up, brush it off, and walk away because I realized my action at that point immediately is not going to, I'm not going to let you control my emotions. Sure. So, it's one thing that my mom has always taught us. You don't let somebody's actions control your emotion because once you do that, you've given control of yourself to that person. Yeah, yeah. So Your mom taught you that? Yes. All right. So when I go out and there's something happening and I realize you're trying to be confrontational, my best thing is I'll move out of that situation and deal with it some way else because most people don't realize that military, pe military people are actually stuck with two different... Uh, I don't want to call it uh, conundrums, but in a sense, I'm under the UCMJ. What is that? Uniform Code of Military Justice. Okay. And I'm also okay. probably covered with the civilian uh, uh, sector. So should I try to come to get in a, a fight or something, I am not only going to be penalized on the civilian side, oh, so but yeah. the fact that I'm a soldier mm -hmm. also going to come into play. And the training that I have is also going to come into play. Yeah. So you have to be able to discern that and then move away from that situation. So nine times out of 10, it's best for me to just walk away. Yeah. And just deal with it. And I found out most people hate it when you walk away. Yeah. Because <laughs> they, they, they want the confrontation, but it's best for you to just walk away. That makes them feel like they have no control over your emotions, and they're gonna say things that is gonna try to instigate you and everything else, but once you walk away, you take away that power they have over you. And 
all they can do at that point is be quiet because they can't say anything else. It's not going to offend you. You just yeah. walk away and let it be. Do people mess with you, dude? Dude, I mean, you're like, I would well, never mess with a, If I didn't know who you are, <laughs> I mean. They really haven't messed with me yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's just one of those things. Everybody that knows me knows I am that way. So yeah. they, they don't really care about messing with me. But yeah. it's just something that even if they did, that's what I'll do. Sure. However, if you do cross my family, which is the yeah, end yeah, in my head, then yeah. that's why I say there's some situations where confrontation is, need, confrontation is needed. Yeah. But as far as me, if I have to deal with a situation like that and it's just me, justifiably so I'll walk away. But if you're trying to harm somebody that's a family or friend, then it could be another situation. Yeah. Yeah. So that's just how I balance this, those two things. I love it. I love it. So, Emmanuel, we're about to close out here. So, just a few more questions for you. What is your What is your daughter's name again? Evelyn. Evelyn. Evelyn Rose. Yeah. Evelyn Rose. Okay. Yeah. So, this podcast is called the Pathways to Success. If you were to define for Evelyn when she grows up, uh, what is success? Like, wh what would you say to her? What success oh, is? Oh, that's a very good one. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can't describe it this morning. Yeah. With Evelyn, I just want her to be happy in whatever she chooses to be. Uh, she to be doing. Um, success to me is not just. Um, getting a good education, getting a good job out there. That was, there's also a, a relation, relations aspects to it, uh, how you relate to your family, to your friends and everybody else. So if she's doing something regardless of what it is that makes her happy, and if she has a good relationship with her family and she's content getting up every day and doing a walk, going to school and doing everything, then I'll consider her success, uh, successful in life. So it's just being able to manage work school or education and then family and your spiritual life if you can have a, a sense of calm or you're content with all those aspects then I'll consider you successful I love it yeah I love it Emmanuel is there anything you want to plug a nonprofit? I mean uh, anything? <laughs> you know, I don't know what is what causes that you're passionate about oh I mean, yeah um so right now on my civilian side I work with L2 defense um, they do all the training, well, we do all the training for the soldiers, and it's something that, uh, actually we're coming, we're going to be visiting the, the Texas, uh, how I call it, Texas A&M okay, campus. Yeah. We're yeah. going to, we, we're probably going to start something new with them in a little bit. Um, but I'm very passionate about my work, like I said, and, uh, part of the reason is because we train soldiers. So L2 Defense, if you don't know about them, look them up. And if you're in the science field or if you're doing emergency management, definitely contact anybody in the L2 Defense. I think you, you'll like doing what you're doing. If you like traveling, definitely contact them. Uh, if you don't want to join the military but you want to do what the military is doing, definitely contact L2 Defense. Uh, Nonprofit, take the Scottish right, obviously, because my wife works there. Okay. If you don't know about Texas Scottish Rite, uh, uh, it's a hospital down in uh, downtown Dallas. It's, it's a pediatric hospital. Deal with kids from inception all the way to 18 years old. It's a nonprofit, so funding is from you and me. So if you can donate to any establishment, I'll say Texas Scottish Rite. Although there's, there's the Shriners and everything else, but I'm biased to that because my <laughs> wife over there. So obviously, look them up, learn about them, and actually donate if you can. Awesome. Emmanuel, this has been a pleasure, man. Thank you so pleasure. much. Thank I you. really appreciate this. Appreciate and everyone that. else, thank you all for tuning in to another episode of the Pathways to Success podcast. As always, make sure to subscribe, comment, and share. And we'll see you next time on the next episode of the Pathways to Success.